I'd like to welcome all of us, both near and far, to today's Monday Thursday service, a service in which we humbly remember the first last supper that Jesus had before he would go on to his death and suffering. I do have just a few announcements to make. The first is that, if you don't mind me sharing, Walt got really good news, as new, best as you can get on the cancer journey, that this uh, shouldn't be as awful as they originally anticipated and hopefully will have healing from this and continue on um, with just regular follow-ups. So we will pray for him as he continues along that journey and that that healing can in fact take place. I also want to and am excited to share about the option we have for Sunday service. We are going to do a drive-in parking lot service for Easter. For those of you who don't understand what that means, it basically means that you can come in your vehicles, tune into a radio station, and see those of us who will be a part of that service up front and hear through your car radios just like you would in a drive-in movie theater. That will occur at its regular hour, 10 a.m., but please follow the instructions that have been sent out regarding that, including those instructions for communion, which we will be doing that day. And now let us prepare our hearts for worship. I would join, ask that everyone join together, both near and far, in today's call to worship. What can we give back to God for all the good things he has done for us? We will lift up the cup of salvation and call on his name. We will offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving. We will keep the promises we've made to God in the presence of all his people. Come, let us worship God. Let us continue worshiping by singing hymn number 202, An Upper Room Did Our Lord Prepare.
Amen. Now, will you join me in the prayer for today? Holy God, source of all love, on the night of his betrayal, Jesus gave his disciples a new commandment to love one another as he loved them. Write this commandment in our hearts. Give us the will to serve others as he was a servant of all, who gave his life and died for us, yet is alive and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. Our scripture comes from the Gospel of John, 13th chapter, 1st through 17th verses, and 31 through 35. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, he put on his robe. And had returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants, you are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. To God. Would you pray with me? Lord God, empty me of me and fill me with you so that the words of my mouth are only yours spoken through me. And Lord, open the ears of the hearers today that they may hear what it is you are calling on their hearts to take from your message into their lives and into the world. We pray this in your precious name. Amen. Recently, I was reading a story about an Episcopalian church in Colorado that has an annual foot washing service. At one of those services, Kenny, a homeless 
alcoholic man came in. He was hungry and ready for the meal, but he was also very dirty. He seemed visibly anxious about how his feet and whole body, for that matter, would be received. When it came time for the foot washing, he sat next to the priest's daughter, who was about five years old. Many people were anxiously waiting to see this little girl's reaction. They were waiting to see how she would react when it was her turn to wash, wash this man's wretched feet. As the foot washing worked its way around the circle, the anxiety began to grow in many of the adults that were there, wondering what this little girl's reaction might be. Then the time came for her turn to wash Kenny's feet. The little girl got down on her knees as if it was the most natural thing for her to do, poured water out, put soap on her hands, and gently began washing his feet. At first, Kenny laughed, but then he began to cry. This led everyone in the room to tears, except the little girl, who was continuing to wash his feet and finishing it off with lotion as if she was finger painting his feet. This little girl's act of foot washing was teaching others the message that Christ was displaying when he washed his disciples' feet that first, last supper. We can learn from John's depiction of the Last Supper, which is the only one that has the foot washing. We can learn what the little girl displayed in her actions. We learn what it means to serve others as Jesus taught us to. The opening of this passage explains that Jesus knew that his final hours were near. This was his last opportunity to share with his disciples all that he had wanted them to learn from him. It also said that he knew Judas was going to betray him. And later, where we did not read, he would, we would learn that he knew all the disciples would eventually abandon him or deny him in his time of need. Can you imagine what it would be like to know that someone will betray you, sending you to your death, and that others would abandon you and deny you at a time when you are suffering more than any human should ever have to suffer? Honestly, I struggle to think that I would even want to know this, because I know as a human it would influence my current interactions if I knew that somebody would deeply hurt me in the future. It's natural to want to protect ourselves. It's how we were designed in order to survive. Jesus' first action never ceases to amaze me. Before the meal, before he would share with them all his last words, Jesus, knowing the evil to come, the future betrayal, the abandonment, the denial, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. And then he began to wash his disciples' feet, all of them, including Judas. I could just see it. All the disciples have gathered in this private room for this last farewell Passover meal where there was no servant present. And they sit at the table looking at one another, saying, who's going to wash the feet? Well, I'm not doing it. Are you going to do it? And then Jesus, without saying anything, gets up, takes off his robe, gathers the basin, water, and towel, and begins to watch, eat, wash each one of their feet. This was not an act of weakness. Rather, it is an act of powerful, empowering service. It is like a sweet foretaste of the resurrection to come. Jesus' act of foot washing is one that would be understood in that time as an act of humility and service. We see this in Peter's reaction to Jesus assuming that the role of a foot washer. Peter initially sees this as an improper action on Jesus' part, given that Jesus was lowering himself to the status of a servant. 
However, Jesus portrayed a powerful kind of love, a love that is willing enough to care for their enemies who may hurt them, a powerful love that overcomes all things, even death, a love that Peter couldn't quite grasp when it was his turn to receive a foot bath. Peter could not grasp it because he couldn't see past himself. He couldn't see how powerful it would be to receive love and service. How powerful would it be for us to remind ourselves that like Peter, we need to receive Jesus' love and service in order to remain a disciple. I know people, including myself, that struggle with accepting Jesus' love sometimes. I accept it and then suddenly I find myself coming back to those past hurtful actions that I've caused to others and I come down on myself for it. But to really accept Jesus' love means trusting that what he did on the cross really does cover our sins, both past and future. Jesus' love would cover Peter's future denial and even Peter's zealous misunderstanding of this current action. Peter's misunderstanding resulted from focusing on his own agenda. How many times do we get so focused on our own agenda that we forget to check in and see if what we are doing is in line with God's ways? Peter was struggling to let go of that dichotic categorization of servant and master. He saw Jesus as the hierarchical Messiah and therefore he should not lower himself to that of a servant. But Jesus' words remind Peter that servants are not greater than their masters. Now to grasp what Jesus is saying is to understand that the Greek word translated here as master can also be translated as Lord. So a better translation might be, servants are not greater than their Lord. To see it in this way is to recognize the metaphor of slavery to God. To be a slave to God, as Paul depicted in his letter to the Romans, is to be wholly devoted to the service of God. What Jesus was trying to teach his disciples is about his actions as they were service to God just as our actions should be service to God. We witness this call to serve God in Jesus' word after he completes the foot washing. After finished washing their feet, he asks his disciples a question. Do you know what I have done for you? For once, the disciples are smart enough not to answer the question that Jesus is tricking them with, or so they think. Perhaps it's because they didn't want to admit that they didn't know the answer. So Jesus goes on to tell his disciples to do as I have done to you. Jesus is inviting them in to service of God, but they still can't seem to get it because they can't seem to answer that original question, do you know what I have done for you? Let us ask ourselves that same question, because we are Christ's disciples, this question is also posed to us. Do you know what Jesus has done for you? If we ourselves can't understand or make sense of what Jesus has done for us, how can we imitate him like he says we should? When we can grasp and answer that own question for our own lives, it is then we can imitate Jesus and be the voice and hands of God for others. So I ask again, what has Jesus done for you? What is it that he has done that brings you peace, joy, and hope? What has he done that prompts you to want to serve God as Jesus asked of us? Whatever your answer is, may it prompt you to let go of your fears or anything that holds you back from joyful service to God. In that little girl's actions, we see what Jesus did for that group of people gathering that day. Jesus showed that group what it means to be vulnerable and love all people no matter what the circumstances are. 
to love even those we perceive as enemies, those who are dirty, those we think are beneath us. For like this little girl, when we love others, as Jesus' final commandment says, it is then that we can share Christ with others. Let us remember to be like Jesus and this little girl, to love all people, no matter what. Brothers and sisters in Christ, come to this table not because you must, but because you may. Not because you are strong, but because you are weak. Come not because of any goodness of your own gives you the right to come, but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and you would like to love him more. Come because he loved you and gave himself for you. Come now and meet the risen Christ, for we are all his body, both near and far. If you haven't already, I would invite you to gather your elements together so that we can partake together as one, even though we may not be here in one place. Jesus said to the people, come to me all who are labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, so that we may truly love you and worthily praise your holy name through our Savior, Jesus Christ. It is right always and everywhere to give thanks to you, the true and living God, through Jesus the Christ, you are the source of life for all creation, and you made us in your own image. In your love for us, you sent your Son to be our Savior. He suffered death on the cross for us. You raised him in triumph and exalted him in glory. Through him, you send your Holy Spirit upon us and make us your people. Give us strength to serve you faithfully until the promised day of resurrection, when with all the redeemed we will feast with you in your kingdom. Through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, now and forever. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, he took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body given for you. And in the same way, he took the cup and he poured it. And he said, this is the blood of my covenant shed for you. Whenever you eat this bread or drink this wine, do this in remembrance of me. At this time, I'd like to invite everyone to eat the bread of the body of Christ that has been given for us. Now, let us take the wine, the blood of Christ shed for us. Drink. us pray. Lord, you have broken yourself open, offering your grace to, to show us love and life. Help us to do the same, loving, serving, and caring for your world. We pray in the name of Jesus the Christ, using the prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom done, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. 
Amen. You there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they nailed him on the tree? Tremble, 
tremble, tremble. Were you 